I grew up in suburban Chicago, and when I was 12 years old, I was invited to a slumber party at a friend's house. It was the end of the summer, it was a beautiful summer night, and we spent the night camping out in tents in her backyard. And unbeknownst to me, while we were playing with flashlights and telling ghost stories, just a few miles away, my childhood home was burning to the ground and my family was jumping out of the second story windows of our burning house. That night our house burned to the ground and we lost absolutely everything. That childhood fire had a profound effect on my family. Before the fire we used to collect the usual amount of stuff. I had a doll collection. My brothers had model airplanes and magic tricks. And after the fire we never really collected things anymore. Instead, as a family, we started to travel, and we became collectors of experiences rather than things. But I think the fire had the biggest impact on my mom, because after that, she had this deep-seated, lifelong fear that one of her own children would lose a home to fire. Well, fast forward 40 years. Now it's 2010, and I live in the mountains outside of Boulder, Colorado. But I'm not there. I'm on vacation out in Port Townsend, Washington. It's a beautiful summer day. It's the end of the summer. It's the last day of my vacation. And I'm spending the day walking on the beach with my dog. And unbeknownst to me, 1,500 miles away, a huge wildfire is burning in the foothills above Boulder, right near my house. So once again, believe it or not, for the second time in my life, my house burns to the ground, and I lose everything. After the fire, one of the hardest things I had to do was to call my then 80-year-old mother and tell her that one of her worst fears had come true. And when I called her, she really surprised me. I thought she was going to cry. I thought she was going to say, oh, honey, I'm so sorry. But these were the first words out of her mouth. She said, honey, you're going to learn so much from this and it's going to be amazing. And I knew in that moment that she was right. I knew that this was going to be a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking experience, because I'd seen my parents go through it when I was a kid. But I also knew that if I kept my eyes open and I kept my heart open, that I could learn so much from this, and it just might be amazing. So what have I learned from having my house burned down not once but twice in my life? Well, the first thing I learned is that I really need people. I have been a strong, independent mountain woman for a long time. I've lived in the mountains of Colorado, mostly alone, for many years. I was a park ranger for eight years, sort of the classic rugged individualist. I was a college professor. And I've always been more comfortable helping other people than asking for them to help me. Well, after my house burned down and I lost everything, I was literally thrown into the arms of my community. And they caught me and held me with so much love. After the fire, I rented a little house down in town. And the day that I moved in, I drive up to the house. And there's this huge group of my friends there. And they're standing there with food and flowers and blankets. And I looked at them, and I started to cry. And they started to cry. And it just got better from there. Every day I would come home to my cabin and somebody would have left something on my door, a pair of shoes, maybe some toys for my dog, or some home-cooked food. And there was this one woman, a friend of a friend, who brought me a big pot of homemade soup every single week after the fire. She would sneak over to my cabin, she'd leave it on my porch, and then she would leave before I could even say thank you or hello because she didn't want to bother me. <coughs> And every week, I'd wash out the pot, I'd put it back out on the porch, she would sneak over, and a couple days later, like magic, there was another pot of soup. And I have to tell you, three years later, to this day, I have never met this woman. There were some really funny things that happened after the fire, too. Right after the house burned down, I was staying with my friend Beth. So we get up in the morning, we have coffee, we're sitting at the kitchen table, 
And Beth is sitting there writing a list. And she looks up kind of absentmindedly. And she says, you know, I'm going to Target later. Do you need anything? And I said, sure. Could you bring me one of everything? <laughs> And all my clothes burned up in the fire. And every once in a while, somebody would say, oh, I like that sweater. Is it new? <laughs> and I'd say, oh, this whole thing, I've had this, I don't know, a week? Because <laughs> everything I had was new. <laughs> but some of the most amazing things that happened after the fire was the incredible kindness and generosity of total strangers. After the fire, my property looked like this. It was a mess burned metal, burned trees, lots of ash. And I had to clean up the property so that I could start to rebuild my house. And it was a huge job, and I can never do this by myself. So I heard about this group that was in town, this group of Southern Baptists. And they had driven up from Mississippi and Arkansas and Oklahoma to help people clean up after the fire. So I called them up, and a group of guys came up to my house, and we spent the day shoveling ash and hauling metal and cutting down burn trees and it was pouring rain and it was this long wet miserable day but we got through it together and at the end of the day the leader of the group came up to me and he said do you mind if we form a circle and pray together and I'm not a Baptist I'm not even religious but I said sure so we held hands and we formed a circle and he started to pray out loud and when he started to pray he started to cry and then I started to cry, and then all the guys started to cry. So there I was, standing in the pouring rain, crying with the Baptists. <laughs> and I will be forever grateful to those gentlemen. They drove hundreds of miles, they slept on a cold church floor, and they worked all day long in the pouring rain for nothing else but to help a total stranger. So the second thing I learned about my house burning down and about losing everything to fire was that sometimes when your life falls apart, you get a whole new life. I've been a writer for many years, mostly a technical and academic writer. And after the fire, my writer friends encouraged me to start writing a blog. And so I did. And I decided to call the blog Burning Down the House. It's OK, you can laugh. <laughs> But the subtitle of the blog is Essays on the Poetry of Loss. So I write about what I call the paradox of great loss, about how when something really bad happens, there's all these really difficult things that happen, but then there's all this wonderful stuff that can happen as well. And pretty soon after I launched the blog, I started hearing from people all over the world. I heard from people in Australia who had lost homes to wildfire. I heard from people in Asia who had lost everything to floods and hurricanes. And people said reading the blog and reading about my experiences helped them feel better about what they were going through and that they didn't feel so alone. So in the way that my community reached out and took my hand after the fire, I was able to reach out and hold the hands of people all over the world through the blog. And the blog also came to the attention of the national media. So pretty soon after I launched it, I started getting called for interviews. So I did interviews with MSN, with NPR, with Fox News. And three months after we launched the blog, it was written up in a feature story in the New York Times. After that, an agent called me and asked me if I'd thought about turning Burning Down the House into a book. So that's what I'm doing now. So today, I have a new house and not a lot of stuff. <laughs> and recently a friend asked me, he said, Andy, what's the single best thing that's happened to you since your house burned down? And I said, you know, I think that before the fire, my life had gotten kind of small. I had my work, I had my friends. It was like my life was on this little track. And then the fire happened and my life exploded. But it made room for so much more. I feel like my life today is so much bigger. And he said, hmm, it sounds like not only did the fire burn down the walls around your house, but it burned down the walls around your life. And I said, that's it. It burned down the walls around my life. And what I think is this. I think we all have walls around our life. 
I think we all have a house that needs to burn down. Might be the house of a bad relationship. Might be the house of a dead end job. It might be the house of too much stuff and not enough joy. So burn down that house, whatever it is. Burn down whatever is making your life small so that your life can be as big as it was meant to be. And if you do that, I'm here to tell you, in the words of my 80-year-old mother, you'll learn so much from this, and it'll be amazing. Thank you.